Welcome, everybody, to Space Force. I am Jason Tondro. I'm Thea. And we have a special guest today, uh, my my colleague and uh, uh, co-worker at Paizo, and my friend, uh, Jason Keeley. Hi there. That's right. Uh, I'm Jason Keeley. I'm a development manager over at Paizo on the Starfinder side of things. So uh, Jake and I have been working through space for a few years now. Yeah, uh, <laughs> when we... When we first were working together, we were separated by about four feet in the same cubicle. Yeah. And uh, and that's when I decided to try and get people at work to call me Jake mm -hmm. because Rob McCreary, our creative director, would walk into the cubicle every day and say, <laughs> Jason. And, we, and I would turn and he yeah. would never be talking to me. Like never, <laughs> ever. He was always talking to Keely. <laughs> and so, and so I, I decided to try and I don't know if it ever actually worked, but now we all work from I, home anyway, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I uh, call you Jake, or I'll, or I'll yeah. refer to you as Tondro sometimes too. Like, yeah, yeah, like good. That's been that's also been a thing that's happened a lot. I've known uh, and been friends with a lot of Jasons, uh, being the age that we are, uh, yeah. right? Uh, and and it's always it it always defaults to last names. Yeah, it's not like uh, Jake. Jake, you're the first one that I've ever been like. Well, uh, call me, you know, call me Jake, call me Jay, call me JJ. Yeah. You know, she's like, let's call me my last name. It's fine. And the the weirdest thing about all of this is we discovered about a year ago that we also had the same middle name. Yeah. So we're both Jason William, which is weird. Like, okay, yeah. having the same first name that's not a big deal, but two people who work on the same product line <laughs> at the same time with the same first two names, like that's just weird. Straight okay, it things. was kismet. Not, yeah. None of this, however, is why we are here. <laughs> <laughs> we are here for Star Trek Discovery Episode 2, which played just a few nights ago this week. Um, and uh, it's a really interesting episode. I was very pleased. I liked it a lot more than I liked the first episode, which is good, because I hate to be the person who doesn't like stuff. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so, so after the first episode, we have this strange... Gra gravity anomaly, the same strange gravitic anomaly that's floating through space. And and uh, in true Star Trek fashion, we have an anomaly to investigate, which is classic Star Trek. But this one destroyed uh, Book's homeworld, or apparently killed everybody on it. And uh, and they didn't pull any punches with that this episode. It does appear that we established pretty clearly uh, at the beginning of the episode that there are no survivors on the planet at all. Um, so which means no, no quick rescues for his brother or his nephew. Uh, and much of the episode is taken up by Discovery's assignment to explore this anomaly and try to get close enough to, uh, detect, get some data on it so we can figure out what the hell it is. Um, there's a brief conversation at the beginning of the episode at the back at Starbase, Star, back at Starfleet, and we get a cameo of the, uh, Romulan president, or the uh, Vulcan, Vulcan Romulan president, um, and, uh, and our admirals and the president of the Federation and everybody. Uh, Saru returns to the ship, interestingly enough, in the in a first officer role, but I don't think he's got any rank. Like they don't refer to him, they refer to him as Mr., like Mr. Spock, and never like, never by a rank. So, I mean, he's officially captain, a captain, because that's his rank, I guess, but mm -hmm. may not be, I don't know, I don't know. G Thea can help us out. <laughs> Thea can help clarify all this for us. Um, but then, then, uh, they, they investigate the, the, the wreckage of the, uh, of the gravitic anomaly and it's surrounded by this huge cloud of like planetary rubble and everything. We invent some new tech, which I want to get to talking to soon about the, the tether we invent and, and all kinds of other things. But ultimately what happens here is, is that book has to go on a one person mission to explore this anomaly. Only his ship is nimble enough to get through the cloud of debris that surrounds the gravitic, gravitic anomaly. Um, and, uh, and, and stand <laughs> companies in a, in, as a hologram, which there's a lot to unpack there that we'll have to talk about as well, but you have your emergency Stamets hologram and, uh, and the two of them get close enough to get a bunch of data, but in the process book has a bit of a psychological crisis. And for a minute there, it looks like maybe he might choose not to come back. That he might he might simply um, suicide mission, uh, uh, but uh, but ultimately book escapes and uh, and is able to grieve. We see him crying at the end of the episode and actually mourning and kind of coming out of this shocked 
state that he was in. And uh, and the final plot twist is we find out that the gravitic anomaly has changed course, which means we can't really predict where it's going to be, and it could destroy anything at any time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so that's the plot. Uh, uh, Theo, why don't you get us started? What what do you think? What are your first reactions to this episode? Um. So we, we we've had this discussion last season. We discussed how you thought the jump to the future was the intended show on those original pitch for the Star Trek Discovery. Yep. Yep. And I I I pushed back on that yep. on the basis that. We've gone through three or four different teams of showrunners up to the point of season three. Yeah, yeah. Now, the person who did who did the show running of season three, Michelle Paradise, she's now doing it for season four. She's the first person to do that, that hat yeah. trick for Discovery. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that these first two episodes are sort of a response to season three. Okay, tell me what you mean. So one of the things we talked about in season three was... Star Trek Discovery is never going to be the show where we spend a whole episode rescuing three people in a lighthouse. <laughs> All right. <laughs> What's the first episode this season? We rescue nine, well, we rescue eight people from a lighthouse, yeah. essentially, yeah. right? Yeah. And this episode, um, one of the recurring themes of Discovery criticism is the show never stops to breathe. Okay. The Neville stops to have a moment of character development. Yeah. And this episode, mm. the whole episode just stops when they yeah. introduce the private ship to ship communicating holographic, which I thought was genius. I, I really like bubble. that idea, that little yeah. privacy bubble, exactly. Yeah. And it, physically being a privacy bubble to actually do some character development, not just on book and his trauma, which is the most pointed thing, yep. but on Stamets and yep. how Stamets was feeling at the end of season three. So we have these two sort of recurring plot points. And granted, if this had been a Bowman era trap, this would have been the whole episode leading up to that moment, yeah. as opposed to it being like the last two acts of the episode. But for the most part, I really do feel that this is sort of a response to the sort of vocal criticism of what sort of discovery has been and is addressing it, like hitting it by the numbers. And so I ultimately went away liking this episode when at first I was a little, um, a little bold because I can't really tell with the CGI muckety muck like what am I looking at. Yeah. So when Stamets makes the joke, well, I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, great, because I don't know what you ended the 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 hook for the first twelve minutes of the episode. Yeah. On this visual spectacle, and I'm like, I have no idea what I'm staring at. Feeling. Uh, yeah, no, I liked it. I thought it had, uh, like, uh, like Theo was just saying, like, uh, when it, when they show it, like, you know, do the polar, you know, polarized the view screen and they show it and everyone's like, what? And I'm like, what? Uh, oh, <laughs> is it, is everyone just odd because it's so big and they're, they're real close to it? Uh, or is it just something? I don't know. And then Stamets comes in and goes, we don't know what it is. And I'm like, okay, well, at least we're on the same page here. <laughs> Uh, and we can get some more information, but it, overall, like it did feel like to me, kind of like uh, a meat and potatoes kind of trick episode where they have a thing and they go investigate it. But while they yeah. investigate it, a bunch of people get in trouble, and they have a bunch of character development, and you know, yeah, uh, uh, in the middle of it all, and and uh, you know, eventually, uh, you know, resolve it with some some good with some some good old fashioned uh, uh, analogy of something that you already know what it is. Like it's like oh these weird waves are coming in. It's like I used to kite surf, and I'm like all right, okay, that's that's pure trek. Where they go like it's just like surfing, and I'm like it it is. It's like a balloon with too much air in it. Um, so yeah, so ultimately you know I, I did I did have a good time watching. I I loved a lot of the little bits that we saw in this episode. I love how like in previous seasons, like especially last season, when we had like the. The, the discovery is in theory like a first uh, like like a, 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 a original series generation starship but then it went to the far future and there was all this crazy technology and there was and now they just invent technology and don't even explain it like oh <laughs> right, yeah. uh, uh, we we need a, a cone of silence on the bridge Boop! cone of mm -hmm. silence and we we, we need a, we want to do like some sort of fishing reel that like connects book's ship to our ship and we'll just pull him back with it. We don't like in the past that would have just been a tractor beam. We'd have used a tractor beam for that. But now like, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna just invent all kinds of tech that we that we 
because it's the future, baby. Like we can invent whatever we want. And I, and you know, that's cool. Like as a gamer, I'm like, great. Cause all that stuff gets to go in the Star Trek discovery source book. You know, we yeah. get to invent all those new cool things. <laughs> uh, I, there was a lot in this episode I really liked. In particular, I thought that the writers were very smart about how they put Book on the ship alone. Uh, and, and so that Stamets is there, but he's not really there. Because if Stamets was really on the ship, we would all know that Book would have to come back, right? Hmm. Book could not crash his ship because they can't kill Stamets. Like they wouldn't just kill Stamets on a whim, right? So but because Stamets was a was a hologram and book the actor is so great like he's so per convincing he totally sold it and I was like about 10 minutes before the end I was like is he gonna die like they <laughs> they had me they they had me hooked and and I, I bought into it for a minute and I, I thought that was it was it was just well constructed because we could see that a meta narrative allows that character to die like Nobody, no, the other, the rest of the crew would still be intact. The show would continue. It wouldn't bring anything to a crashing halt except for his contract, right? And, and so, anyway, it, it was, I thought that was well done. Um, uh, for those that I know, occasionally I mentioned Star Trek Online. There's a weird coincidence with this episode because if you played Star Trek Online, Stamets is a recurring character in that, in that game. You meet him, but the trick is, is that you meet him as a hologram. Mm -hmm. There's this long, there's this long mycelial networks plot line uh, in oh, right, Star yeah. Trek Online, and your guide through it is the emergency Stamets hologram. And I couldn't help but wonder if I don't think that's a coincidence. It can't be. I don't know. It feel it felt like <laughs> either a nod to the game or an excuse for where the hologram comes from. Like the hologram that you meet in Star Trek Online is this hologram mm -hmm. that somehow got preserved. I don't know, but I thought, but but as an old gamer, that that was kind of cool to see. Uh, yeah, Keely, you we, we haven't had you on the show before. Like, how did you meet Star Trek? Are you? Oh, what, sure. What what is your Star Trek story? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I, I'm I'm of of that age uh, that uh, G Next Generation was on TV uh, when when I was growing up, you know, For and sure. I was maybe like in high school. Uh, and so I, I started by watching that. I maybe caught some of the original episode, original series episodes earlier, but never really, you know, got into it. But watched Star Trek: Next Generation. So that's my, that was pretty much my jam. You know, watching, I think maybe a couple of the uh, original series movies in the theater, and then like yeah. probably all of the Next Generation movies in the theater. Um, and then you know, just sort of then, then it was you know, you know, Star Trek at that point. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, did, I started to watch Deep Space Nine. Didn't quite gel with it same with voyager uh, uh and then only recently in the past you know five 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 or so years uh uh paula uh my partner and i have were have started rewatching. we rewatched. we went through the whole original oh, series we okay. went through next gen again okay. uh we went through event we, we again kind of bounced off the beginning of d space nine and then we went into voyager we watched all that and then we went back and watched d space nine pretty recently so okay. d space nine is at a forefront in my mind lately uh and uh i think i ended up liking it at least big chunks of it a lot more than even next generation okay. uh you know kind of overcoming the nostalgia factor that in that sense and seeing all the the, the good fun stuff that happened in, in d space nine um we don't know if we're going to watch Enterprise. Uh, we're all just kind of like, yeah, I think I watched it when it opened the first couple episodes. I'm like, eh, I don't know if I really want to. And, you know, we've been watching Discovery. We've been watching um, uh, 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 Lower Decks, which actually, now that I think about it, Lower Decks might be my favorite track oh, uh, right now. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, 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 Prodigy, the first couple episodes of Prodigy. That, that oh, sure. So we've been watching kind of, you know, I've been watching all of it pretty much. So are, uh, I, and you, you're an old time gamer and you like to experiment with new games and new game systems. Have you ever done a Star Trek game campaign? Uh, I have not. Uh, I, for, for a while, I don't, I haven't really gone into uh, not too many licensing, you know, like yeah. existing ones until sort of like recently when I've got this group that just sort of we cycle through games every couple yep. months or a month and a half or so. So we've gone on and then I have Star Trek Adventures role playing game. I bought it you know, Gen Con when it came out and I've flipped through it and haven't played through it yet. Although my brain uh, wants me to run it as a pigs in space, to like hack it so it's pigs in space and then just that because 
I, everything has to be completely silly for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, as uh, as someone uh, who enjoys Enterprise, I would definitely give Enterprise a shot. Okay. Get the credits. Uh, yes. Those only yes. full scene. Those full seasons. Season four is really, really good. Like season four is sort of like the treatise of what the show should have been mm. yeah. all along. Um, but those some those some gems in in the first three seasons. Sure. They yeah. also have the best western. Like if you're a western fan, I don't know. Mm. Uh, uh, but if you like a wild west adventure, No Star in season three is the okay. best Star Trek meets western that they've ever done. Okay. All right. Yeah, we'll definitely have to check that out. All right, so let's get into some specific stuff from this episode. How about Saru? Saru's return. What do we think about Saru? Now, I I went on record last episode as saying that the first episode of the season is called Kobayashi Maru. It's all about the captain being able to accept failure and death. And I put 20 bucks down on Saru dying in the last episode. Um, What do we think? What do we think today? Now that he's on the ship, I mean, I guess that makes it a little more uh, <laughs> odds in your favor. Um, I uh, I don't know. I don't I don't I don't think that's going to happen either. But uh, uh, the him being on the ship now and also being Mister Saru, I mean, it's yeah. Uh, uh, Burnham calling him old friend. It's very much. You, you said last episode it's very Kirk and Spock, and now it's even more Kirk and Spock now that she's yeah. the captain and he's Mister Saru. Uh, 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 I don't know. Yeah, again, he's just a first officer. Whether or not. You know, all the if he has any other kind of position in terms of like, because you know, Mr. Spock was the science officer, basically, right? And he did all the sciencey stuff. Is but Mr. Saru seems like he's more, definitely more emotionally connected, where yeah. he can be, uh, 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 put his hand on on you know Burnham's shoulder and be like, you know, put aside the captain now and now I, be the partner. Maybe he he's just maybe the all in a weird way the ship's counselor, even though. Uh, uh, the doctor is also going to be doing that, possibly. I love this idea that that being the first officer on a Federation starship is like being appointed to the Supreme Court. It could be anyone. Like I could literally mm-hmm. appoint my dog first officer, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, help us out here. How, what's the rules? Well, how does this work? Well, full stop. Military ranking does not apply in Star Trek. It just doesn't. They use yeah. it sort of as the shorthand to be like, okay, who has the authority in the scene? Yeah. Um, funnily enough, Will Wheaton has a story about how he had like a contract negotiation, and Paul, the contract negotiation when when he was getting like a season three, season four renewal, okay. was they would promote him to lieutenant as okay. opposed to giving him money. Okay. So it, it was like, and he was like, but like, I'm an actor. I need money. Like this is this is how it works. I oh, I no. work for you. I give you my time and my days, and I need. You know, I expect to be compensated for that. Well, like, no, no, we'll make you a lieutenant. It's okay. I can't pay my rent with a promotion. Exactly. Yeah. On a, um, yeah, on a TV show. On a <laughs> I mean, when you mentioned uh, Keely, you mentioned the uh, the Star Trek movies. Like, by the time you get to Star Trek Six, you've got three captains on the Enterprise. You've got Spock. You've got Kirk. You've mm-hmm. got uh, Mr. Scott, the captain of engineering. Like, they'll just. So apparently you can just accept anyone to be your full staff so and just be like, okay, this is going to be, this is Mr. Saru's spot on the bridge. And this is how he's a dead Kelpian walking. <laughs> oh no. Um, I, I, I did, however, I found the, the, addi- the return of Saru to the crew to be very good. My, my complaint with the show for a while has been that Burnham is never wrong. And this episode, Burnham needed advice and support from other characters. And I liked that. I, when, when Saru was there to say like, hey, you know, like, let me give you some advice. Like, let me tell you what you want to do. And, and I know what you, and I like that. I, I, I thought the dynamic was really great. It does feel very Kirk Spock in, a, in, in the best way. Um, and I mean, Doug Jones is, is wonderful. So I'm glad to have him back on the show. The, the uniforms, like the burgundy uniforms, also reinforced the Kirk Spock dynamic. <laughs> it felt very Wrath of Khan era uh, to me. I don't know. Yeah, well, definitely in a Wrath of Khan. It's interesting because Alex Kortzman has gone back to the well in Wrath of Khan a few times. Yeah. Like he's he did it, like, you know, he's he referenced it in like the Thor Transformers movie. Like he 
Kobo <laughs> into darkness. Like he's gone back to this idea of exploring these themes. And I think this is the most mature he's approached the material. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of like Saru being reintroduced to, to the ship and to the, the bridge crew, like the writing is top notch. Like yeah. those, he gets one or two really good lines of dialogue. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm going to be really sad when they kill this guy off. I, I, my favorite bit in this whole episode is actually when Tilly says, "Are you taller?" Did you? <laughs> I love that. I, she's so great at the delivery, and 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 uh, she's like, "Did you? Are you taller? Maybe you're just swag." And I just like that whole that whole sort of walking conversation. Um, is is if uh, if Burnham and Saru are Kirk and Spock, is there a McCoy? Is Tilly the McCoy? In this situation, no. The uh, closest you get to McCoy is book, right? Like the book. So the way the cult spot, the triumvirate works yeah. is you have to have a character who's the focal. That would be Bonham. She's yeah. in the central seat. Yeah. Uh, you need someone to play off of Hole, and the closest you get to that is is book. And you know, in the new movies, the closest you got to that was a whore because the Fulcrum was Spock, not Cole. That's right. That's mm. right. Well, and this makes sense too, yeah. because McCoy was always the emotions and book is the empath, right? Mm-hmm. So we've mm. got the empath and, and Saru as the, the, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I gotcha. What but, we really need is we need interaction between Saru and book. That's what yeah. the show is missing in terms of like cementing the triumvirate. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And the, the show has always been very reluctant to do anything that doesn't have Burnham in the center, right? So having a conversation between Saru and Book or having any kind of relationship between Saru and Book is really hard for this show because um, it, it de-centers Burnham. And that that's something that... The sh- but but we do see... I, I want to um, uh, uh, agree with something. I don't remember which one of you... Uh, I think you both got into it. But this issue that... Uh, the way that um, Stamets relates to Book in this episode, I loved how the way that book is pulled out of his suicidal urges is with Stamet saying, you saved my family. And of course, this is what book is feeling like he wasn't able to do for his own family, but he was able to do it for somebody else's. And this helps book feel like he has value. Like he has, he has accomplished something of worth in the universe. He has, he has saved people's lives. They weren't they weren't the lives most important to him, but they were the most important lives to someone else, right? And this helps Book decenter himself and realize that it's not about me. It's about all of us. And I hate to say, I believe I'm going to say this. It's about all <laughs> of us working together, which mm-hmm. is which is this show's all the time overriding theme. And I hate it, but I also love it <laughs> kind of. You know, <laughs> with a love and a hate. Anyway, I just, I really love the writing, the way that Stamets was able to pull that experience from the end of last season. Uh, he even makes that joke about it, that business about blowing me out the airlock, which was a great, great <laughs> bit. Yeah, good comic. And I like uh, how it was played up for, for comedy as opposed to, like, it was played as, as defensive comedy. And as someone yes. who practices defensive comedy uh, all <laughs> yeah. the time, I was like, oh, I know that feeling. Yeah, That's a little too close to home. I'm going to make a joke about it because I'm actually still really upset. But mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, what? If, okay, so... What about this, the, the whole central problem of the episode, like the gravitic anomaly and all that's going on? Um, Keely, what, what do you think about the plot? Is it, is it working for you? Like, is it a, is it a good bad guy? Or, or It's still, I mean, we're still, it's still a big question mark, right? Yeah. Now, especially even after they've gotten the data and be like, it moved. Ugh. And then they pull back. What was that? Was that an eyeball? Was that a spaceship? You know, like it looked exactly kind of unclear. So, uh, uh, you know, are we looking at? I mean, it still remains to be seen. If we're looking at some sort of giant cosmic evil entity, that might be. You know, I don't know how I feel about it. Yeah, in, in terms of if it's you know some sort of spaceship in the middle of that doing all the all the nonsense, or if it's just a somehow a sentient uh, 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 cosmic force. I don't know. Yeah, thoughts. Is this are these the um is this the alien probe uh 
from so, Star Trek Three. I don't. I don't think we're going to be doing that because we did that last season, right? Like season yep. three, the whole thing was um, we think it's a menace, it's something that we had to blow up, and instead it's a it's a child yep. crying mm-hmm. out for their mother. So we've already done that plot point. This can't be like another alien race is trying to contact us from the great beyond and doesn't understand how all Euclidean geometry works. Like we can't <laughs> do that note again. The sec, you know, the next season. Um, I'll be honest, the plot isn't working for me. Okay. Um, I was a little zoned, like once the first 12 minutes happened, yeah. And we got the uh we got um the the musical note in the um like I, I own the other soundtracks, and I'm like, oh, that's the song they're playing here in, in the briefing meeting when the when they all like get their orders is Pike on the Bridge. Like it's one of my favorite tracks. Like it's on repeat when I write, like the okay. Star Finder when I submit my stuff. Like that's that's the song. I'm like, oh, I know that song. Okay. That's, that's okay. the action adventure song, right? Okay. Um but for the most part, th- this plot is it's too big. Yeah. Like I know we've destroyed a whole plan of people and that we're cycling it through the lens of Buck's grief. And yeah. that's very human and that's very small, and I can latch on to that. Yeah. But when like Keely said, when the camera starts pulling out and I start seeing like what looks like multiple black holes and then like cosmic planets and galaxies funneling into this thing, I can't wrap my head around it in terms of this is working for me. When the episode started working for me again was when Stamets has his breakdown on like when Book calls him on his shit and it's like, you haven't said the five words to me. <laughs> in the last six months and then Stamets has no other option but to be emotionally vulnerable and be like hey yeah. I'm not going to look at you while I'm saying this because I got a machine <laughs> I can ignore you with the machine <laughs> but um, this is what I'm feeling and once they did that I'm like oh, okay we're back to Star Trek we're back to yeah. something I can latch on to yeah. I don't need to be worried about the big picture I need to be worried about this one man who's going through grief and the one person who would have been going through grief and is awkward about being in the in in this essentially shuttlecraft with them. Yeah, yeah. And I agree. Like getting a an intense character moments between Book and Stamets was what it's a refreshing change for this show, frankly. Like I'm not used to seeing that uh when Burnham's not in it. And and so I, I was glad. Um look at I was really surprised that the crew after they figure out that the, that the gravitic anomaly has changed course, you might come to the obvious conclusion that we can get from that, which is that it's it's got some kind of intelligence behind it. Like if if an asteroid, if an object was coming into our star system, and it suddenly changed course, the only conclusion would be that there was a intelligence there, right? Like things don't just change course in science. Uh, unless somebody makes them change course, somebody does something to make it move. Um, they didn't say that and they waited for that weird reveal where, yeah, like you were saying, Keely, like, is that, is that an eyeball? It looks like an eye. Is it, is it a giant spaceship? I, I don't know. Yeah. What it is. yeah. Um, I, I don't think that discovery, as you were talking about Thea, every season, is we're gonna save the galaxy, right? Like this is the this is the in many ways the JJ Abrams Star Trek television show. Like every every episode every season has got a huge galaxy threatening menace that we have to stop. Um and this is this is ours. I don't think that as in it's hard for me to imagine the writers of the show writing a natural disaster that has no intelligence or big bad guy behind it like if it's just some sort yeah. of galactic tornado that's interesting but i don't think it's a season long interesting right like there's got to be some kind of reason behind it or else it would fall flat unless yeah this element is only going to be here for the first part of the season yeah then it goes away and then the second half of the season is focusing on the other rest of the yeah season. that's possible like it's the it's the fallout of this this event like i really yeah. hope it's not some like 
bad guy or you know, I don't want a con. I do not want a con. I want <laughs> like this thing happened and it sucked. Now what are we gonna do to piece these worlds together again? Yeah. 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 Um, let's see what else have we have we not touched on? Um Tilly gets a subplot. We haven't yeah. explored it too much, but apparently she's she's got some kind of issue that she needs some counseling with. Uh, any thoughts or speculation? I I I just well, yeah I wanted to talk about that too because it was Good. like the fr the first episode she you know starts talking to Brenham and gets interrupted. There's something going on. You said maybe they're writing her off the show or not, but she's gonna go off and be captain of her own thing. But something's going on with Tilly. We just yeah. don't know what it is. I mean, she had some trauma with the you know the the the, the, the Nalus uh, dying because of the that you know the last episode. Yeah. But it's it, it was happening before that, and she's yeah. uneasy. I don't know in her, in her position on the ship or just having some some thoughts about like what am I gonna do with my life here you know, 900 years in the future where basically everyone else I know is dead. Uh, you know, I don't know. But uh, if, if I understood right, it sounded like when they mentioned briefly that uh, Burnham mentions to Saru that Saru was offered the captaincy of, was it the Sojourner? Is yeah. that the <laughs> is that the same Voyager mission that the president mentioned last episode? No, I don't think so. Okay. Because yeah. uh, I thought... So is that what they did? Did they offer him that mission? But that's a completely different issue. Okay. Um, and that offer came from Admiral Vance, not the president. Ah, okay. Yes. So it looks Good like point. the president's using Voyager as like, that's going to be the flagship of the Federation, like choosing the plant whole flag on that ship. Okay. And she's going to select the person who's commanding that, whereas Vance will select, you know, the captains of the other ships. I gotcha. Okay. So Theo, what do you think about Tilly? Um, I really don't know where that plot's going. Yeah. Um, I think there's, have you guys read Olson Scott called, um, Indoor's Game? I haven't read uh, it. A while ago, but yeah. Okay, there's a character in that book called, uh, named Griff. And Griff is sort of like the quintessential sergeant who's running these children and yeah. he and because it's through the children's perspective they have no concept of what his internal struggle is yeah and as the book goes on he's gaining weight okay and you find out at the end of the book once they resolve the plot and they they stop the the, the wall that the reason he's gaining weight is that's the only way he can feel decent about himself is he's just overeating Okay. And I'm kind of curious to know if that's going to factor into Tilly's plot plot point, uh. because she's she's gaining some weight, and I don't I don't know if that's if that's a, just a, a reaction of being we all in COVID and it's very difficult to exercise. Yep. Um, yep. Or if it's going to be a plot point in Star Trek. Like I don't I don't know where that's going, and I don't want to speculate because it just makes me sound like an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't want to be an asshole because I'm 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 very body positive, obviously, <laughs> and I have to be now. Um, not now, but anyways, um, it's just it's 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 a weird plot point. I think there's going to be some sort of trauma there because she makes mention in the full steps of the season that yeah. feels like yesterday and a thousand years ago. Like she's obviously mm -hmm. someone who's displaced. Like Michelson pointed out, she's physically away from the crew. I sort of reject the idea that she's part of the triumvirate because she isn't interacting with them on an right. interpersonal level. She's right. interacting with them on a, a business working relationship. Yep. But we don't know well, like Michael was Tilly's best friend season yeah. one when she was exercising and running through the ship. That was Michael who was running next to her. And now she doesn't have that support structure. She yeah. doesn't have Stamets because Stamets has moved his his parental attention to Idira. Yeah. Um, so so that connection for his his uh, whole personality is is gone away. She's sort of ankleless within the crew. Um, mm -hmm. Mary Wiseman gave a brief interview um, about a month or so back, and she mentioned that this is a problem for Tilly because she used to be rooming with Burnham, 
right? And and now Burnham is the captain. And and there's a weird kind of acknowledgement that your friends are moving on. And what are you doing? Like your friend and and, and what's your new relationship with these people? And what are your goals? And 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 how do you relate to all of these folks that their lives are so different? It's it's kind of like when when one friend when a pair of friends, one of them gets married and has children. And suddenly everything they want to do involves kids. And you're like, I, I'm not married. I don't have kids. How do I relate to you now? Like, what do we talk about? Uh, and and <laughs> that kind of unusual um, change of your relationship. Um, I, I wonder, I guess what I'm getting at here is, is I wonder if Tilly's problem is not a big problem. It's a relatively small issue and it gets resolved fairly quickly. Um, it reminds me a little bit of... Um, uh, some of the subplots from last season that we thought were going to be big things, but end up getting resolved with like, you know, a passing comment, like, oh yeah, like I did this thing and now I'm fine. Like, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was resolved the same way, right? right? Like that was the Detmore plot the right? that we thought that, okay, mm. is, the, is the control inside hole implant? And it's, no, she just needs to have a conversation with Dr. Colbert about, hey, I have some issues. Yeah, and yeah, we never yeah. got to see the, what that conversation was. That's right. We just saw the start of that, and this was the start of that. I think a little earlier. I think there may be a more uh, another complication. Okay. But Tilly feels like she's in the narrative liminal space between main character status and bridge crew status. Yes. Yes. So she's mm. kind of in that weird sort of like mixed juxtaposition between not quite either place. Yeah. Um, the last thing I want I, I wanted to bring up uh, is the subplot of um, Adira's partner, whose name I have forgotten. Gray. Gray? Is that right? Yeah. Gray. Gray, get, Gray is getting a body. There was a brief call out to Picard uh, mm -hmm. as the um, the trendsetter for this this phenomenon, where we we build you a an android body and download your brain into it, and uh, and you get to live and you get to live a second life. Uh, as well as an explainer for why we don't all do that. <laughs> of course, it only worked once, and now we just can't it's get it to work again. Until it will work for you, but yeah. Um, what I was struck by was the, the the use more than once of the word transition, as Gray was talking about their body. As I make this transition. And this idea that the body, they remove that mole, if you remember, on, on Gray's hand as uh, something, well, why don't we take this opportunity to make the body more like the actual me? And, and, I, and I, I wondered, like, you know, what, what you, am I the only one that's seeing this as a, a, a oh, no. allegory or what? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 I you you might be right it does seem like i mean i i, I feel like since i mean I, I don't really remember uh everything that we know about gray from the yeah. previous season uh but uh the way that uh, uh he was talking was that he had transitioned in his corporeal form earlier right right, uh, right. And, and in such a way that you know he was like oh i had a lot of other things i was worrying about i wasn't gonna worry about my mole um uh right. so i feel like that that and they're just sort of uh extending that analogy a little bit more i guess i don't know Thea? it could be a, we haven't gotten the episode right yes like right. this is this is just this is laying more of the track for yeah. whatever that episode's going to be yeah so we could take it as this is the in canon acknowledgement that gray is uh trans masculine that uh he transitioned from you know a she yeah um with the word transition we can also read it as oh no they're just talking about going from being a non-host trail yeah. to being a host trail yeah like yeah. those there is also that reading that you can can do if you've decided that you don't want to see the actor okay um like if you're putting your blinders on, your transgender blinders, and like I just want Star Trek to be not about things that Star Trek's about, right? <laughs> um, so there's a little bit of that reading. Now, the thing that gives me hope is the fact that 
when they just remove the mole and it just goes away, yeah, they cut back to Adele's face and their expression is a conflicted one. Yeah, yeah. Like it's like the actress, the actor is really uh, good at conveying sort of ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, like you should be able to do that. Like, like I want to support you in that, but it's also. Like how far are you going to go with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when we get when we get the episode sometime later this season, when they sit yeah. down, we're like, okay, this is going to be the transitioning from a consciousness to now you're a real boy, right? right. Um, in in a soon body, which brings it back to Pinocchio. Yeah, which brings mm -hmm. it back, well, you know, right back to Data's plot yeah, point for sure. Like sure. this is sort of the ultimate wish fulfillment of that character. By another character, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm hoping that they they go more into exploring that and saying it directly because sometimes you you have to talk to the cheap seats, <laughs> just like we did in season three when yeah. we did the when we stopped the whole episode to uh, establish a dealer's pronouns as they them. Yeah, and yeah. we pause like the episode takes a breath. It's one of the few times that Discovery exhales. It feels yeah. like. <laughs> Um, and that was done not because it's a big deal in the 29th century. It's done because it's a big deal in the 21st century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm really hoping that that we get a a, a exploration of this later on. Um, but at, at present, uh, it's going to be a cautious hope. Sure. Yeah. yeah. The um. I, I agree. Like Adira's got some conflict going on in this whole process. It, it, it feels to me like, like if I was Adira, I would be wondering what our relationship was going to be like when when you get a body again. Like, it would be, <laughs> like what is that going to be? And are you even going to stay with me, or are you going to go off and you know be a be a whatever? I'd be whatever you want to be. But, uh, and a guardian. Uh, 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 what Greg's talking about uh, becoming a guardian. Is that that's the the people who who tend to the to the symbiotes, right? In the in what we in our household call the trill milk, um, <laughs> that that uh, that pool, right? That's what a guardian does. Yes. Okay. So that well, that clarifies that uh, that Gray would not would not be on the cast, for example. Um, right. Yeah. If if uh, if if. Gray became a guardian because Gray would presumably go off to the Trill homeworld and and not be on the ship. What's the other thing that that Gray brings up in that scene is that that he can become a host again. A host again, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he that would might... become Gray something else, you know, mm -hmm. Gray Dax or Gray, yeah. you know, uh, Inabran or you know whatever new new last name. And we don't know the dynamics of their relationship in terms of did it deal and know gray before it was gray tall yeah because mm -hmm. that can like we're told in trill society we're told that like relationships aren't supposed to be maintained like cisco is the anomaly right 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 yeah. though uh one 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 doubts that that a uh symbiote has been in different hosts I doubt that happens very often in Trill society, right? So you're not, you know, Gray getting a second symbiote, essentially. That's going to be something that I'm sure we'll have to explore in terms of figuring out what that does to your mind, what that does to all the consciousnesses. Do they, do, you know, do, will when Gray incorporates, is he going to have all of the all of the tall memories still too? I mean, one assumes it's in your brain and it'll stay there but is that, is that going to be a weird conflicting are we going to have to have another facets episode where they all talk to each other oh i hope they have another facets <laughs> episode that was, that was such a charming episode that was fun all right well uh, uh if anybody has any last thoughts or observations on this episode um I, it was nice to be on vulcan even if it was just a hologram it's always nice to see oh, yeah. Like it's a nice little CGI thing, and I like the fact that that we've established that the holodeck can be anywhere now. Like it's, it can be in any corner. It's like yeah. I think that's genius. Yeah, that's. I I, I love. I still love the the relationship tension between Saru and the Vulcan president. 
Um, and and like I get a room, you two. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> and and I want to see if Saru dies. I want to see him have some kind of scene with her before he goes. Uh, like, let's get some. I don't know. I, I those two were meant to be together. I'm convinced. <laughs> We get, we do get. I mean, we saw it in the trailer for the season, obviously, but we get the quick glimpse of the Ferengi uh, on in, in Starfleet, and I'm wondering, like, since that Ferengi is is in this Starfleet chamber with all the other, I want to assume, it's admirals and and, and in, whatever. In uniform, I think. In the uniform, yeah, exactly. Like, what? Who are we gonna see that? See that person some more? Are we gonna know more about this Ferengi? We're we gonna come back. Uh, I really hope they'll like the captain yeah. of the the Eisenberg. The, the, the nog, the uh, nog yeah, reference. Yeah. I really yeah, hope. I really hope it is. Um. All right. Well, I think that's once again we we don't get a trailer. Apparently, we're not getting trailers for next episodes anymore. That's true. So we're all just riding on the edge of our seats. But um, but I'm much more enthused about this episode and this season now. I'm hoping that maybe um maybe the the first episode was just not doing it for me because uh they had too much exposition to lay down i don't know but um but if we can if the writing continues to be this level of quality then then I, i'm very much looking forward to it and uh we'll be back next week where our next next week's guest is uh jim johnson uh, who is the uh, project manager for the star trek adventures rpg Ooh, very nice uh yeah He's going to come on and gamify the hell out of this show for us, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, he knows how to show me a good time. And uh, <laughs> uh, we, and and then I'm I'm hoping now, uh, Thea, you could clarify this for me, but it sounds like Netflix or Paramount figured out where their what side of the bread their butter was on, and and are now mm. reaching out to show uh discovery to the rest of the world and international market so we may be able to bring egg back um uh and bring him back like like mr saru we're going to refer to him as mr smith from now on well we can bring him back like uh how scotty died in the episode the changeling where he dies for like five minutes and he just comes back <laughs> and no one no one no one mentions the fact that they just killed off scotty for five <laughs> minutes <laughs> Uh, but I, I thought hopefully we'll we'll be able to get aid back on the show soon. But in the meantime, thank you so much, Keely, for coming on and sharing My pleasure. this episode of Star Trek with us and for your yeah. Insight. Again, uh, thank you for uh, asking me. Well, I, who who the heck am I? You're right? you're my you're my bud. You're my. Uh, you, you I'll take it. To be fair, let's clarify something for the audience out here. There is no one alive who has developed more Starfinder adventures. Than this guy, I was I was thinking about that the other day. Actually, I'm like, oh, oh no, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> oh no, what's happened? What is where? Where has it all gone? Where you you have made a lot of adventures for this space yeah. game. So that I think yeah. that makes you eminently qualified to be a critique of Star Trek. Star Fair Trek. enough. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for watching, and we'll catch you next week on Space Force. Bye. -bye. Hold on. Okay. Now we're now